Welcome now to Culture at Work on the Business Radio Network, presented by Crest Insurance with host Matt Nelson. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, today to uh, our episode of Culture at Work in Tucson, proudly presented by Crest Insurance Group. Uh, it's a show where we learn from and celebrate the local leaders, businesses, and nonprofit organizations who have stood the test of Tucson time. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Nelson of Crest Insurance, and I'm joined here today by uh, my colleague and, and I would say my friend, Paula register Absolutely. Um, she's the chief executive officer of Tucson Orthopedic Institute. And in honor of Women's History Month, uh, we're here to talk about women in leadership and how that relates to workplace culture. So first and foremost, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. It's, it's truly a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, so for anyone who uh, listening, if you don't know, the month of March is National Women's History Month, and it's it's actually not uh, just an arbitrary month uh, that the, the U.S., Britain, and, and Australia just pinned on the calendar. It it actually started with uh, International Women's Day. It was March eighth. Uh, it's in the early 1900s, and that kicked off National Women's History Week uh, under President Carter in 1980. And uh, finally, that led to Congress declaring March National Women's History Month in 1987. And uh, I, the interesting thing to me, actually, is that it, it really took a grassroots movement to get it all started, uh, the catalyst being the National Women's Party campaigning for the vote in the early 1900s. And so I guess the irony is that uh, March became National Women's History Month uh, really because of a march on Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. So so anyway, so enough for the, his, uh, the history lesson. But, but Paula, thanks again for joining us. And, and let's set the table a, with a bit of your background. You've been a leader in some fairly complex industries, including healthcare and education, and you really came about it the hard way, which is through the financial side of the business That's uh, mm-hmm. as a CPA and as a, as a CFO, C, uh, CFO. And yet, you're you're one of the most friendly and approachable people that I know. So, how did that all come about? So, Matt, um, early on in my career, um, was an accounting major in college. Uh, enjoyed accounting, made a lot of sense. Uh, and so I started on the business track, uh, did my couple of years in public accounting, and um, then I went home and I decided to work work a few years in my hometown. But I was recruited to be um, sort of the first CFO for uh, my son, my pediatric, my son's pediatrician's medical group, which was interesting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I did that for a while. Um, and let me back up before I got into. Uh, Healthcare, I got into public education. So I went to public education. I'm sorry, I have a bad cold today. So you're going to have sure. to forgive me during this podcast. Uh, became the CFO for a school district. Um, and it was interesting. I was in public accounting and I was recruited to be the uh, assistant superintendent for finance for a school district and learned so much about how school budgets are put together and about how schools operate. Uh, it was fascinating. And as I as I said uh, to someone recently, um, schools have their normal start of the year, end of the year, their vacations, their celebrations. Um, it was a wonderful field to be in. And I, I came at that from the finance. But when you're an assistant superintendent in a school district, there's a lot of operational responsibility that comes with that. And so I found that I truly enjoyed working with people and I enjoyed the operations side. And so then my next career uh, really uh, was moving into um, healthcare, and and again, my son's pediatrician recruited me to be the first CFO of, of his large multi-specialty group in North Carolina, and um, again, huge business side of healthcare and uh, physician practice. But uh, with that came operational. Uh, objectives that had to be met to reach your financial goals. So I found myself immersed in putting in a new EMR or a new uh, billing system and making sure that all of our um, functions and our operations ran smoothly uh, to, again, reach the financial goals we'd set for our group. So I I just think that I started to lean more towards operations, you know, the more I became immersed in in healthcare and subsequently um, went from uh, CFO to CEO roles uh, when I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then you got into consulting after that as well and, and spent a lot of time traveling. I did. So I, how did that come about? So I, I had already moved to Tucson at that time. I had worked here for a couple of years with a large health system. And one of the consulting groups that I uh, hired to work on a compensation model for us offered me a position um, to work with the biggest uh, uh, 
health, healthy living lifestyles company in the in the world at the time. It was Healthways, and uh, I was joining their consulting arm, and we were putting together clinically integrated networks across the country. So I went from Jacksonville, Florida, to Honolulu, Dallas, uh, Notre Dame, and we we spent a lot of time in South Bend, Indiana. So I was all over the country putting together networks for hospitals, physicians, uh, really in the in the objective of promoting the triple aim, you know, better patient experience, more cost efficient and better outcomes. So that was totally rewarding. And I learned so much about healthcare during that period of time. And where did you pick up that that triple aim approach? Because that's, I mean, is that something that you saw in the educational system as well? Or is it, where did that germinate? That from? has been the mantra for healthcare for a long, long, long time. And um, really, uh, once businesses found that they couldn't afford the health care that we're delivering. You know, you know this better than anybody, Matt. The cost of health insurance goes up every single year. And businesses were struggling with that, but also with an accountability to say, if we're going to pay more, we want the very best. And, you know, if our, our patients are so well educated today. They have the internet. They have so many resources to find out what's wrong with them, what their treatment options are. And so the drumbeat early on was make it better, make it more cost efficient. And by the way, we want a great experience during the whole process. So this has probably been on the forefront for, I don't know, 20 years, I would say. And now there's the quadruple aim. Now we're also working on the physician experience because there's such a shortage of physicians. And we want to make sure that we keep everybody together uh, and everybody's kind of moving in the same direction so we don't, we don't uh, marginalize or deteriorate any of the services we provide through healthcare. Absolutely. And the workplace culture seems to feed right into that. It does, right? Matt. A- it does. It's um, We at TOY, um, we always strive for continuous improvement. That, that's been my drumbeat since I got there. But we really want the very best service that we can deliver. And I won't say we're perfect. You know, every company has a goal and objective, and we're as strong as, as our weakest link. You know, so I always say to our team, you know, just work on getting better every day. And we have three sets of customers. We have our patients in our community. We have our associates, each other, and we have our owners, you know, our physicians that own the practice. So we really want to make certain that we're delivering the very best quality and best service to all three groups every day. I mean, let's face it, we spend a lot more time with our work colleagues many times than we do our own families during the day. And so we want to make sure that we come to work and treat our colleagues as as kindly and as nicely as we possibly can to make their day better and to assist them with whatever they need to have accomplished during the day. I think that'll help our patients because then we're all, you know, rowing in the same direction there. Sure. But the patient community, um, we see a lot of patients every day, Matt, in our many locations. But patients come to us not feeling well. They're hurt. They're injured. um, They have, you know, significant pain or chronic pain. And the last thing they want to do is deal with any drama or, or problems on our end. So we're constantly looking at our um, our approaches to patient care, our processes, our systems. How can we make everything more seamless for the patient and easier for the patients to access us, get the care, and then, you know, bill responsibly following that that occurrence. So it's it's constant. Well, and that, so that brings us to, to Tucson Orthopedic Institute, and, uh-huh. and maybe you can tell everybody if they're not familiar with Toy, uh-huh. you know, a little bit about the practice and, and kind okay. of where it's come and, and where it's going, because that, that really was the catalyst for bringing you to Arizona functionally. It, well, and um, so certainly we um, are 26 years old this year. Uh, started by three practices who found it better to be together than apart, you know, for all the economies of scale and and the efficiency, you know, purposes. Um, So they came together for all the right reasons, and we've grown uh, since that time. We now have uh, five uh, primary uh, clinics. Um, We're we're throughout Tucson. I think we're the largest in southern Arizona. Uh, We have multiple PT clinics. We have six locations for our physical therapy. Uh, But we work with all the physical therapists in the community uh, to make sure our patients get good post-acute care. Or if they don't need surgery, that they get the good therapy they need to get back to good health. We work with uh, skilled nursing. We work with inpatient rehab. We work with many hospitals in the area. Uh, We try to work with all of them that we possibly can. So we try to be a great community resource. Um, Right now we have 32 physicians. We have 33 uh, PAs, nurse practitioners, and we have about 300 staff in TOY, um, and they're great. They're just great. 
Well, and you know, it's funny because you were talking about continuous improvement. Mm-hmm. And so uh, those who are listening, you can't see in front of me, but I've got a magazine that uh, when, when Paula was still relatively new, I guess, in Arizona, mm-hmm. there was an article in uh, Biz Tucson. And um, you talk about continuous improvement, mm-hmm. this idea of, hey, you know, let's get 1% better every day. Absolutely. Uh, and there are two words that are two things that stuck out with me, and it comes from your time in Hawaii. Um, so you mentioned uh, kind of learning the true meaning of the word aloha. Yes. And then, and if I if I butcher the the phrasing of the word, <laughs> correct me. But uh, there's a phrase kino ole, uh-huh. uh, which is a, a Hawaiian word for flawlessness. And then later on in the article, there's uh, an example of you looking at the lobby in one of your facilities and recognizing that the patient experience wasn't great because of some operational and some logistical challenges Correct. with layout and people mm-hmm. waiting in line and things like that. And uh, for me, I, I guess it's it's impressive and, and also nice to hear that you know, somebody as high as the CEO of the company walks into the front doors of their operation and says, let me ask myself how this patient experience is going. If I was standing in that line, how would that, how would I feel about that? And so can you, can you share a little bit about kind of how those concepts relate to the way that you approach things from a continuous improvement perspective? At Abs- Toy? Absolutely. I, um, I had the benefit early on in my career when I was working with Catholic Health Initiatives to go through Quint Studer training, and it's really about service excellence. And the Studer approach really is it's everybody's job every day. So if you see trash on the floor, stop and pick it up. If things look a skew on the tables as you're walking in the waiting room, straighten it up. Um, help somebody when you're walking along. Uh, get them, do some wayfinding. Um, it's everybody's job to make everybody feel welcome in your house. And, and until in, in our clinics, that's our house. And um, so for me, uh, I, what I, I don't like long lines. And if people are less than ambulatory, you know, they have hurt, hurt, feet, knees, arms, and they're in pain, they don't want to stand in a long line to wait to get to their appointment. So we had, we've done this twice now in two different offices, logistically changed our um, our check-in approach to make sure we have more staff available for people to check in and that we're more efficient. We're working on technology every single day to make the, the pre-check-in process more electronic so that people can come in and just sort of be ready to go. Um, but we did remodel our off, our biggest offices on the campus of, of Tucson Medical Center, and that's our east office. And we remodeled and really put our team in the waiting area where the patients were because we were kind of tucked off uh, away from the patients at that point. But now we're right in the middle of our patient waiting. So if anybody needs anything, they can get right to us. Uh, and you can enter from both sides of the office. Uh, and, and it makes it much easier, much more accessible um, and I think that our patients appreciated that. I, I don't like long lines. And what that does, if you're in a long line, it, it backs up the whole treatment process. So they're waiting in line. They're not getting back to see the physician or getting their x-rays or, you know, or any other, you know, DME or treatment that they would possibly need. So, so we really, we took a look at that. Sometimes you'll catch me sitting in the waiting area watching people and watching how things are working. Um, we just re- recently added some pediatric um, uh, kid-friendly uh, waiting area furniture and things for our children, you know, because we, we do offer pediatric services at our locations. Um, and, and, you know, from time to time, the offices, you know, they look a little little beaten up. So we have to do new flooring, new painting, things like that. Um, and we remodeled our front office at our Northwest office for the very same reason. So we we try to look at it. We add more x-ray when we have more patients um, so patients can get through that process quickly. But it's important that. I mean, if your patients aren't happy, they don't want to come back. And you want a great patient experience because a, a happy patient will tell a lot of other happy patients. Um, an, an unhappy patient will probably tell two times that amount. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that. Sure. We know that. So we now reach out after every visit. Um, if you come to see us, you'll probably get a text or an email with a picture of the provider to say, hey, thanks for coming in today. If you have any concerns or any problems, give us a call. You know, this is who to call um, because we want to know. You can never get better unless you know what went wrong. That yeah, makes sense. I, uh-huh. Well, and so kind of jumping back to the to really Women's History Month and, mm-hmm. and kind of the role of women in leadership. I mean, healthcare is one of those industries that you know, I mean, certainly healthcare has a high female provider um, population. Mm-hmm. But when I think of healthcare leadership kind of over, let's say, the last 20, 25 years, um, 
it doesn't jump off the page to me that there was a ton of women in leadership roles throughout the right. various health systems around the country. And so how has that changed throughout your career and, and even maybe across industries have you, as you've kind of migrated from education to managed care organization to provider side or actually provider side to managed care and then back to provider side? Uh, maybe contrast a little bit about what your journey has been like as, as, as a woman really kind of rising fairly quickly through the leadership ranks. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, you're in Becker's Hospital Review. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're famous. I'm actually quite honored to be sitting across the table from now, you. You know what? I have been very fortunate in my career to make the right connections at the right time. But it's funny, Matt, when I first got out of college and I was a young CPA, I remember being in an office with mostly men. Um, all men accountants, you know, they are in the leadership positions. Um, they always treated me with the utmost respect and kindness and, you know, quickly promotable. Uh, when I left that and went into um, education, mostly male principals, you know, but there were a lot of females in education at the time. So, I mean, the fact that I was an assistant superintendent at that time and a young woman was probably, you know, relatively novel at that point in time. Um, but again, I was always treated with dignity and respect. Um, and then into healthcare, my first foray as a, a, a leader in the biggest health system I ever worked for, all the managers were men, and I was one of the only women. But um, I never felt that I was treated differently. I think I was always treated with kindness and respect. I didn't have bad situations that I came upon. And, and I think... Um, what I found out is that it, it's sort of how you conduct yourself. Um, if you are looking for an issue in anything in life, you're probably going to find it. Sure. But if you approach everything with, I'm going to assume that I'm going to be treated with dignity and respect uh, and and look for that, I, I found it. Um, and I, was, I certainly would call it out if I didn't find it. But I think that... Um, I have, I have been fortunate to have worked with a lot of very professional people, some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Consulting team I worked with for three years, smartest, and that, and that was practically an all-male team, smartest men I've ever worked with in my life. And, and we started to get more female consultants on my team. But then consultants are usually by expertise. That's how they join a team. So um, I felt like uh, I was among colleagues that, that were all working in, for a common vision. Um but today, and it's funny, when I was in Chattanooga as a vice president and a CEO there, um, I remember hiring physicians for our group. We had about 130 physicians in that group. There was a point where we had more women physicians in our group than we did men. And so I, I, even though there's always that um, uh, the balance that, that we're all looking for in life, I do feel like I've worked in industries where there have there have been always been a great representation of females and a, a good representation of female leaders. I think if you're a female, the world is just wide open for you today. Um, be smart and do all the right things in, for the industry that you're wanting to go for, and, and the doors will open for you. I, I have never personally felt any bias in that direction. That's good to hear, and uh -huh. especially when you look at it over a time series. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, one of the things that we seem to be really kind of looking at and, and taking a deep introspective look. And I, there are obviously some just logistical challenges. I'll, I'll use motherhood as an example, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That, that you have to manage through when you're building a workplace culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think about, you know, I'll, I'll use, um, you know, my mom is my hero, right? Uh, my, Mine too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my father passed when I was very young. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, I was raised by a single mother. I was one of three. And so, I mean, she worked incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And so I look at that now as, as a father to a four-year-old, and I'm fortunate. I'm married way over my head, and uh, <laughs> my wife does a fantastic job of, of really managing our, our house and, and taking care of our daughter. And um, I can't imagine you know, trying to do that on my own. But even even if it wasn't on my own, I, I just think about all of the pressures that you get pulled in, you know, just professionally. Yes. And then you add on trying to to be a mother and, and you know, that sort of thing. I, you know, when you look at the culture that you've cultivated at Tucson Ortho, and, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate I've got a bit of an inside look as, sure. uh, as to some of the leadership at, at Tucson Ortho, but how have how do you manage that just from a practical standpoint because there are some logistical challenges that are just going to be unique to to, mm -hmm. to being a woman and a, and a professional sure 
Well, I think that, um, first of all, the, you know, the, the time off benefits and the health insurance benefits that our company provides are very good and very attractive and take into account life happens. Um, our, our owners, um, all have families that they care deeply about and they are very hardworking physicians and surgeons and, um, PAs and nurse practitioners, but they all care very much about their family. So they have a good respect for the balance of that life. Now that said, we work very hard as well. So I think what, when we staff, we take that into account that there's going to be times where people just can't come to work. You know, children are going to get sick. People get sick. They need to take time with their families for vacations. And so our our structure and our benefit structure really addresses that, I think. It's never perfect. You know, everybody would love to have more time at home and, and less time at work, but um, we, we're still a business. You know, that my job as CEO is to make sure that business is viable and can work. But, um, I mean, I think we try to provide as much flexibility as we possibly can uh, within the parameters of a regulatory environment that healthcare is. Some jobs inside Tucson Ortho are much more flexible. Many of our staff work from home. Uh, some of our billing team works from home, um, which allows a little bit more flexibility. Um, and I think, you know, from from the perspective of um, patients, what we try to take into account is moms and dads can't always come to a doctor's office between 8 and 5. We have after-hours care in our biggest location from 5 to 9. Uh, Monday through Friday and then half days on Saturday. So parents can come after the hours. Uh, it's, it's hard on staffing to work those late hours too, but then they have mornings to get things done. But um, And we appreciate all those who work those extraordinary hours for us. But we've tried to look at our community from a flexibility perspective, but also from our staff's perspective. Um, and I, I really do care deeply about every member of our team. I, my favorite management quote is, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And I think if if people truly believe you care and that they can try to work with you within the, the boundaries of our company policies and procedures, then I think it creates a great workplace. I really do. Um, we always try to, you know, role model uh having it all <laughs> but that's harder that's harder math than than it seems my greatest admiration to any woman who is a who is first a great mom a great wife um a great person uh and then you add on the leadership role to that uh and and we are juggling a lot of balls but i would say fathers do the same thing my husband is a a busy anesthesiologist but he's an amazing father too and he's an amazing husband so let me say that so so as men and women in our community we are asked to to you know spin a lot of plates and do a lot of things but I think moms by nature are are real total caregivers and taking care of our kiddos is always probably number one it is it was for me it was always been number one and I I know that happens with our own staff and I respect and appreciate that. Well, and so it's funny because we talked a little bit about kind of moms and and, yes. and heroes. So, uh, you know, last month we talked about mentorship, mm -hmm. right? And it's one of those topics that I think honestly you could you could discuss mentorship, pretty much any topic. Yeah. There's a mentorship tie to it, absolutely. But so when we look at this in relation to uh, this discussion, you know, what what woman inspires you, and 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 why is it your mother? Is there, are there were there professional mentors? that kind of coached you along the way? How did, how did you know, Paula come to be Paula? Well, I will say this. Um, my mother and my grandmother, very Southern. You can probably tell by the accent. I'm pretty Southern. Um, always gracious. Always wanted to take care of people. And my mom worked. You know, she worked her, my whole life. And um, she worked, and then she came home. She cooked dinner. She helped us with our homework. She did, she did it all. And so she made it look easy. She really did. And I admire her for that. My sister's an attorney. And she has two beautiful children. One's about to, her last one's about to graduate from high school, but she took time off when the kids were young and stayed home with them. Worked from home a little bit, then went back to work. She eased back into it. She made it work for her family. So those are two of my, if I had to say, my role models or my heroes. My mother and sister are totally that. But I have seen so many women throughout my career, Matt. And I, just to call one, I mean, I, maybe in in history and in national leadership. Women who are passionate about their causes, they're passionate about their family, and they juggle it all. They just juggle it all, and they're good people. Those women stand out in my mind. Um, we were talking this morning about uh, our chamber, you know, Executive Director Amber Smith. And, you know, I, I have such respect for her as a young woman and, you know, young family. She's doing great things for our community. Um, 
and and you can look everywhere and see great examples of women. So I have tried to really watch women as role models in my career. I had a great boss when I was in Chattanooga. She was a beautiful, gracious Southern woman, and you know she 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 just made everybody feel at ease and comfortable. She was highly accountable. You know, she she could, she had the rough side. You know, she could she could hold you accountable at the drop of a hat. But so I've really tried to pull that from from every experience that I was in, the good and the bad. Sometimes you learn from your worst managers how not to be, and I've had that as well. And I've had colleagues that I that I found that I, I don't want to deliver my message in that way. So I've tried to balance, you know, learning from the real models and learning from those that um, were less than role models in my mind. That makes sense. Uh, well, especially because you're going to encounter both, right? You are. That's, <laughs> that's what life is made of, Matt. <laughs> so, you know, something that we've talked a lot about, um, and it actually wasn't a planned question, but we've talked a lot about it. And, and as we were talking, it, it just, again, it, it seems... Uh, apropos, as it were. But so we talk a lot about community, Mm -hmm. right? So the Tucson Chamber is a great example of an organization that's really at the intersection between business and the community. And oftentimes those are talked about like they're separate entities, when in reality, I mean, we're a community comprised of people, much like a business is an organization comprised of people. And I know Tucson Ortho is very active in the community now. You know, I I tend to have hobbies that involve breaking bones. So I see your lot. (laughs) I'm a mountain biker and a cyclist and stuff like that. But, um, Uh But, you know, so I see Tucson Ortho involved quite a bit. And we've talked a little bit about the role of both key community partners uh, like like businesses, but also the role of chambers that kind of pull people together so that they can have that dialogue and build that fabric. And, uh, you know, how do you see that as a, your workplace culture kind of carrying forward the same concept inside your organization and then materializing outside the organization as being involved in community causes and things like that? It, it really is an extension of the three customer base that we that we have as our core. So if we say our community is one of those customer base, bases with our patients, how can we help our community get back to th- the things they love? We, I mean, we kind of use the hashtag, get back in the game. So we try to support those games that people love to do. Uh, tour de Tucson's a great example. We were a proud sponsor of the 50 mile leg of the tour for you know the past several years. And I, it, I still get chills on the day of the event watching such a diverse community of people on bikes, all sorts of bikes, you know, um, young, old, people with braces. They're all out there in the thousands riding in, in the community. And what a great thing to see. Um, so it, we're, that, that's a slam dunk for me. We, we would sponsor that and, and just be so excited about it. Um, and then, then you think about high school sports. I mean, we all we all participated in some way, whether we were an observer or a teammate or a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader, obviously. But um, the high school sports is kind of like the pulse of of sports. You know, it's where it kind of all gets started. So we are actively involved in high school sports all over the community. But we also get involved with um, you know club soccer teams. Um, we did some work with the new ice skating rink downtown, the the hockey team. Um, we sponsor some golf events. Uh, we do, I mean, we try to be very diverse in, in how we get involved. And we do a lot of education for the community, Matt. So we're out talking to retirement communities. Uh, we'll talk at schools. We spend a lot of time talking at um, the place at La Cunada. Uh, we, we talk at hospital events. We want people to um, really have the best and latest knowledge about orthopedic care that they possibly can have because we have a huge research division inside of Tucson Ortho, and we believe in continuing to find the very best ways to care for patients cutting edge. And so I think we, we truly do that. Um, but I think that uh, so it's education and it's participation, you know, is the best way to do that sense. And so uh, for those of you who might be just joining us, uh, this is Culture at Work in Tucson. I'm your host, Matt Nelson. It's a show proudly presented by Crest Insurance, uh, your hometown insurance broker. And uh, my guest today is Paula Register, Chief Executive Officer of Tucson Orthopedic Institute. So we'll pick it back up. Um, You know, we talked a little bit about education. And, um, you know, if there's somebody listening right now that you know they're hearing your story and they're saying you know what that's that's who i want to be that's that's who i want to model my life off of um 
you know, I want to do that. I, how do I be that person someday? What, what advice would you give to that person? That, that's a good question, Matt. Um, I had this conversation with someone on my team the other day, and I, I said, I, how I got where I am today was a pretty circuitous route. Uh, and sometimes I think I stumbled into great scenarios to get where I am. I, if you'd asked me as a young girl what I was going to be, it would have been a wife and a mom. That's, that's all I ever really wanted to do. Um, but I knew I wanted to be a, a participant in my family's household and um, went to college and, you know, but didn't really determine my career path until after college and, and through life experiences. But what I would say to someone today, and I said this uh, lovingly, is imagine the life that you really want to have and live. Imagine your best life and, and all the things that it takes to live that best life. If you want to be if you want to have a ton of kids, you know, and take care of all those children, think about how the career will fit into that life and 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 with your marriage and it, marriage or no marriage, you know, whatever your choice is. But imagine your personal life and then imagine your business life and how they can be most compatible. And it might not be easy, you know, what you choose, um, but but imagine that and then go after that from an education perspective, from a location perspective where you might find the best opportunities. Meet as many people as you can that are in that that role and in that business um, and and spend time and see if you actually like it. Because it would be easy to say as a young person, well, gosh, I want to be the CEO of a company. But I had no idea back then what it, what it actually entailed or the sacrifices that you have to make to do that. There's probably not many vacations or, or times away from the office that I'm not thinking about work too. It's hard to dissect it from, you know, your personal life and your work life. Um, and, and make no mistake, I've done some amazing fun things in my life personally, but um, it, it is a huge commitment. So I think you have to go into anything that you want to do with eyes wide open and understand what it takes to be successful. Lots of hard work, lots of um, flexibility, uh, and and lots of willingness to learn from people, as I said, the good and the bad. Um, so I, that would be my strongest advice to anybody. You you can never go wrong getting your education. You know, continue to learn every single year. I've spent uh, every year of my career going to conferences, uh, getting further education. At Toy Tucson Ortho, we've read a book every year, uh, a management book or a a lifestyle book that really helped us be better leaders. And um, from things uh, about, we, we've learned from Navy SEALs uh, about how to be better teammates and how to rally together. We've learned, uh, we read The Way of the Shepherd the first year I was there, um, local celebrity, local writer there. Um, but just keep learning, keep learning every single day and reading and um, observing uh, amazing leaders. That would be my best advice. What do you th what do you think about you know this this idea of continuous improvement and mm -hmm. continuous education? Right, it really seems to speak to um, kind of leading a life that's that's a bit disciplined, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, how do you find yourself, especially with everything that pulls you in every possible direction? Right. Um, what is your routine that kind of keeps you moving on that direction so that you can stay disciplined and continue to develop? Because it's very easy, of course, to kind of take your foot off the gas pedal and, and coast. Yeah, it, there's no question about it. Um, well, to, a funny thing, and then then I'll tell you how I keep my work-life discipline. Um, I, I read an article probably a year ago from a, um, a military leader who said, make your bed every day. You, you, you complete one task, and then it's easy to do it the rest of the of the day. It's true. You know, have that personal regimen that gets you in the game and gets you up and going every day. Um, so I try to make my bed every day. If I don't, you know, I'm having a bad day. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I, I try to take care of my house like I take care of my um, work as well. Because if, if I come home and things are neat and orderly, you know, that makes me a better person, you know, on a daily basis. So that's my little weirdo thing about Paula. But from a work perspective, um, it's watching the numbers. So I firmly believe uh, every leader has a number that they need to look at every day. Um, you know, in, in our business, we watch a lot of different numbers. We look at the number of phone calls coming into our business every day um, and how long someone had to wait on the phone, how many calls got dropped, um, 
That's important. It is important. Uh, if you ever stayed on the phone with the IRS, you know how long it takes sometimes <laughs> to get through. So again, if, if you can't get through to me, you're probably not going to come in and see me. So I pay attention to that. We look at the number of patients that are coming through the door at each office every day because that tells us how many people we should have staffed there, what we should expect for the day. If it's a 500 patient day in one of our clinics, it's going to be a busy day. So all hands on deck, everybody be watching, you know, what's coming through the door. Um, we look at our billing. We look at our uh, encounters that need to be coded on a daily basis so we can keep our, our cash flow moving in an appropriate way. Um, I look at patient satisfaction uh, every single day as well. I, I take joy in the wonderful stories or kind emails or texts that we get relative to good experiences. Um, and I take personally the the dissatisfied patients and what went wrong um, and, and how can we do it better next time. So, you know, I, you just have to stay with the pulse of the organization in every area. So um, I, I really, I probably push our team too hard to say, follow your numbers, follow your numbers and, um, and, and really, every day, I try to engage in some way with a clinical process. This morning, I helped a patient get in to see us that, that has some acute pain. I did that yesterday. I did it Saturday. We had a neighbor fall off a ladder, and I was able to help them. Those are little ways I can contribute to the operations of my business. But I believe if everybody does that every day, we're a better company for that. Um, so the discipline, I would say, is follow the numbers, um, Follow the uh, the satisfaction with your company. Uh, that that keeps me in check um, and makes certain that everybody uh, is current in what they need to accomplish every day. So I do a check in, a check in regularly with everybody to make sure that we're on track with all our processes. It's a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It is a lot. Um, and and you know it all that. And then then the biggest part of my job is strategy. Um, you know, you always say skate to the puck. So where should we be going next? And that's a huge part of a CEO role is making sure sure that, um, you know, some people say if you're not growing, you're dying. Uh, are we growing as appropriate for our community that we're serving? And so I'm looking at where are we not serving patients? Where do I need to be next? Or um, which new um uh, service do we need to be adding to Tucson Ortho to take better care of our patients? What location? Uh, you know, we're looking at something midtown right now, uh, and we're adding a different additional services that will come up uh, later in the year for our patients. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's finding the appropriate balance of the role every day, but also staying very connected to the operations because, as you said, if you coast, it'll get away from you. Sure, it totally will. Everybody accountable every day. What's something that you've learned that surprised you? So you you went in th went in thinking you understood, and then the more you learned, you recognized, oh, this is something unexpected. I didn't know as much as I thought I did. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly went into orthopedics thinking this is one specialty. Um, this will be great to focus on. You know, I I can really sink my teeth into this, and I had no idea how diverse orthopedics was as a specialty because we see we're subspecialized. We're a multi-specialty orthopedic group. We go from spine to pediatric surgery. We do hips and knees, shoulders, hands, elbows, uh, foot and ankle. Um, we do pain. We um, I'm probably leaving somebody out right now, and they'll kill me if I. <laughs> we have research. Uh, we have our imaging department. We have our PT department, and I, I'm sure I've left somebody out. But it's it's such a diverse offering, and you know when something hurts, if your knee hurts, it might not necessarily be a knee pain; it could be a hip issue. So again, that's why you have orthopedic specialists, and they're so smart, and they know exactly how to triage that care. But I had no idea how how complicated it could be and why it was important for, all, for, for me to be paying attention to each extremity specialist and making sure that their business was on track for that extremity. So our bodies are complicated instruments, but you know what? We're pretty repairable. I, I'm fascinated by what our surgeons and our physicians can do to really get us back to good health. Um, the, the body is remarkable. Well, and you actually, I think this is almost like the CEO's dilemma, right? Which mm -hmm. is, uh, so you're in a leadership role, yes. and in your case, you know, you're leading people who are in a tremendously complex industry, right? Yes. Tons of specialized knowledge, and so 
you know, like you're you're not an orthopedic surgeon, and yet you're leading people who are subspecialties of orthopedic surgeons. Yes. So, from a leadership perspective, how do you establish a culture and and kind of get to that point where you can lead people, even if they have a specialty knowledge that is completely different than or deeper than what you might know. And how do you get a build build a coalition around that with your culture and the way that you approach people? So I think that um, start with respect. You know, have greatest respect for the knowledge that each surgeon brings to the table and um, create a, a governance structure that's made up of committees. So, you know, people with the greatest area of expertise and quality, you know, in, in promoting great outcomes come together. They lead their teams by example we have an executive committee at Tucson Ortho of you know which is a good uh, representative mix of our subspecialties they lead the group as well um, and then we have leaders within the organization some clinically trained some business trained that bring different levels of expertise to the table so I think it's it's a healthy balance of all of the above and you bring in the right expertise at the right time um, back to the uh, Hawaiian uh, the kanole uh Right place, right time, right person, you know, the whole nine yards. Every Everybody has a role at a certain period in time. And so, again, and, and, and we're organized in teams. You know, the physician is kind of the captain of the team. But, you know, he'll have a, a medical assistant, you know, a surgery scheduler, appointment scheduler. And we might have a cast tech in that team, a coder, a biller. Um, everybody that works around that surgeon to really make that a good experience for the patient. And then we have all of our support teams, like our accounting, HR, um, the billing teams. Um, everybody works in tandem to make that team very successful. Uh, and again, a constant work in progress, Nat, Matt, um, because it's a, it's a very difficult labor market here in Tucson, you know, to get – we always try to, we, we, on our team, we try to say we're trying to find the unicorns, people who are just magically special, you know, <laughs> that can work at Tucson Ortho and, and really make a difference because the right person can can be um, uh, such a game changer for us. But I think that with that um, high level of training and expertise from orthopedic surgery, um, we always we always bring our physicians in and our surgeons in for that uh, direction for that uh, strategy and, and you know, strategic direction for the company. So when you try and describe, and, and you know, it's funny you talk about uh, kind of Tucson and looking for unicorns. I So I didn't always live in Tucson. I grew up elsewhere, as, as you did. I traveled around a little bit. Yes. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason why I live here now and I've stayed here, right? And so I've had people ask me, how do you describe Tucson? And um, so how do you describe Tucson when, when you're talking to somebody from, from back home in North Carolina or anywhere else you've been and they ask you, well, what's Tucson like? How do you describe it? How do you describe the community? What do you think, for example, that people should know? And where do you think Tucson can get better? Well, I, I say that I never expected to stay here, and I've been here 10 years now. Uh, I never expected to come from the south where I had all those flowers and trees to the desert. But I just I find it um, unexpectedly magical. Uh, it's wide open spaces, beautiful stars, beautiful landscapes. Things bloom when you least expect it. Uh, and the weather's much nicer than anybody can imagine. Um, we don't have nearly as much rain as we had back in uh, Chattanooga or North Carolina. Uh, we experienced some of the best weather in the country. Nothing remarkable except for the heat. And it's a dry heat, <laughs> <laughs> as we all laughingly say that. But um, but I will say that people come here for a lifestyle, and I think it's a little a little more relaxed pace than perhaps some what I experienced on the East Coast. Um, I think people take joy in nature and being outside. Uh, all the vitamin D is probably great for us. <laughs> I know I feel a lot happier all the time than I probably did with all the rain and the snow before. But I, th I think that um, that really it, it is a uh, it's a it's a kinder, gentler. Uh, community way of life. Not that we don't have our stresses and our anxieties here, but it is a little bit different pace. It, it, pace is probably a good word for that. Uh, and the way Tucson can get better, um, grow appropriately, you know, respect our resources. Um, Water is obviously a resource that we all have to respect in the environment and uh, be good to our community, be good to nature um, and grow in a way that will really help our communities uh, thrive and grow. Um, I think we're already great. Uh, if you, I think about when I first arrived here 10 years ago to now, Matt, all the great industries that have come to town and, and really made Tucson a better place. 
Um, we have family in Phoenix, so we go there fairly often. But I think we're a great uh, community close to Phoenix uh, to live and work in and raise families. Um, so I think we just continue to improve our infrastructure and our schools and our health care. Um, Tucson will grow appropriately. There's no question about it. I love it here. My son's moving here this month, as a matter of fact. So oh, I, nice. I couldn't be happier. Nice. Good <laughs> yes. for him. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of one of those things. It grows on you. Like you, I it never does. I never thought that I was going to be staying in Tucson. I, I went to school somewhere about 92 mm-hmm. miles north of here. And, uh, you know, it, it grows on you. It's, it's it a does. fantastic place to live. It's it's wonderful. It it really, I, and, and when I think about living somewhere else, it kind of makes me sad to think about that because I would miss the beauty and the splendor of the desert. It's, sure. it's really elegant. Oh, agreed. So, you know, healthcare, and, and you mentioned that as kind of, you know, education and healthcare being two key issues, right? Which, um, you know, Tucson, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways, is following the national discussion, right? We're having Absolutely. some health care is probably, uh, if it's not the top issue, it's it's very high up there in, in things that people are talking about. So what is something that um, you wish that people understood about health care that, in your experience, they don't? Um, just by virtue of lack of perhaps exposure to kind of the inner workings of the system and that sort of thing. And, and of course, you've got perspectives from both the management side, from the payer side, from the provider side, and everybody's got their own, you know, kind of motivations and things that they, that, that dictate why they act the way that they do. Right. I, I, well, I will say this. Um, one of the most complicated things about healthcare, Matt, is the way we get paid. Um, people have health insurance and, you know, that you, until you need it and you start utilizing it, you don't realize how complicated it is. Unlike going to the grocery store and buying a loaf of bread, everybody's going to pay the same price for that loaf of bread. But in healthcare, and, and the folks on our end who have to work through that, when you walk in the door and you offer your insurance card or not, um, we have to think of hundreds. I mean, we have hundreds of different ways that people walk in the door to to get paid, and not every visit costs the same thing for every health plan. So. It's quite complicated. We expect a lot for the people that work from us to understand the nuances of, of all the insurance plans, of all the Medicare, Medicaid, um, and all the regulatory requirements that go into delivering health care, the HIPAA privacy issues, um, you know, uh, making sure that your your medications are current. And, and, and it just we ask a lot of questions because we have to, to take good care of you. So I, I think that it seems like a pretty easy I'm going to go to the doctor, make me better. But behind the curtain, everything that we're doing is so complicated. I would just ask for their um, patience and their understanding as we try to navigate through that because um, we have people of all education levels that work with us. And as I said before, uh, it's a very difficult labor market, not just here, across the country. I think um, that's a good thing for the United States that we have a lot of jobs that demand good skills. There are no easy jobs in healthcare anymore. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, stand on your left foot and juggle three balls in, in, to do your job every day. Everybody's doing that. And so I think it's, I, I would ask people to understand that it is quite complicated and, and we're not always going to be perfect. Mistakes are going to be made. And because we work with human beings and human beings are not perfect. And so if a mistake is made, um, I always approach things that I think people always have the very best of intentions until they prove me wrong. Uh, so if we've made a mistake, please allow us to correct it. Um, that's what we would like to do. If people are intentionally making mistakes or continually making mistakes, they probably don't have, they're probably not in the right job, you know, for that role. But I would say that um, for the most part, everybody does a great job every day. But it, it is complicated. And sometimes, you know, uh, a mistake can be made. Um, but I, I think that the the payment system is one of the most complicated things. And then I think also um, just how broad the treatment offerings are for people uh, to understand. Everybody's different. So just because your neighbor had a, a maybe a joint replacement and went somewhere after the joint replacement, that might not be the right treatment regimen for you. So our doctors will treat the patient not just a type of injury. You know, they're going to look at you as a person and try to determine what's the very best protocol and treatment regimen for you. So um, it's those are two things that I think are super important for people to remember in healthcare. 
I think, uh, you know, you're, you're, the way you describe patience, you know, patience and, and kind of leading from a position of giving somebody the benefit of the doubt, it's yeah. something that probably spans a lot of industries. I mean, absolutely. I, I think about education as a great example <laughs> no where it's, you know, I mean, I'm certain that was, mm-hmm. that resonated in that field as well. Um, so when you look at, um, when you look at like a difficult situation in your environment, I think a lot of people really, you know, when you think about, oh, I want to be a CEO, uh-huh. right? And, you know, Functionally, you know, you, you see the title of a CEO, and there's a, I think, a lot of gray area between that and what where the rubber actually meets the road. And, sure. and my experience, and I've been fortunate um, by virtue of my industry that I get to work with a lot of CEOs, and yeah. I get to see how um, they each approach a situation. And I think one of the things that's uh, become apparent is is that uh, you you kind of become a professional firefighter, right? No question. <laughs> um, no question. Uh-huh. And and you're becoming a professional firefighter, and and one of the other things is that, quite frankly, the fires that you're fighting, uh, by the time they've reached your level, um, it's we're not talking it's about yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're not talking about small, easy to handle things, yes. and so it seems to me that a commitment to you know, kind of having that grace under fire and that being able to slow a situation down and and you know really make sure that the other person feels enfranchised in that discussion. It seem, They seem like key skills. Um, can you think of a specific situation or, or something like that that, you know, really encapsulates that? So somebody really, when they say, hey, I want to be a CEO, all right, this is what that really entails when we're dealing with stakeholders within our organization and things yes, like that. Absolutely, Matt. Um, and that happens every day. Um, uh, ideally, um, you want to anticipate what can go wrong and plan for it and empower your frontline folks to take care of it. In a lean world, you know, in a lean healthcare world, you're making sure your managers are very strong and that they can put those fires out before they become a, a roaring blaze. Um, and so I think that that's, that's critical to being a good CEO is finding those people who are good at that. Uh, and, and also having staff who are well-trained to anticipate those situations as well. We do a um, we have a new uh, marketing manager who's great. Oh, shout out to Frankie. Uh, we love having him on our team, but he has been doing a newsletter for me uh, since he started. And every newsletter we focus on uh, customer service. We have a vignette uh, with some good quotes from a great book that we've been reading on service excellence um, to make certain that we keep it front and center. And so it, it's everybody every day thinking about how to put out the fires and how to prevent the fires. But uh, I think that at the CEO level, they're usually big fires. Sometimes they're just people who knew you and want to tell you what went wrong with their visit. And I'm always glad to hear that. Um, sad to hear it, but, but I learned from it. But sometimes the fires are big. So I think that, that one thing you have to be prepared for as a CEO is um, listen. You better listen and really take in all the information. There's always two sides to a story. So listen to everything that went on. You know what, And, and there's always um, mitigating circumstances for a big fire or a little fire. So you know, gather as much information as you can. Um, try not to leap to uh, mistakes I've made in my past. I've, le- I've leapt to a solution with, without involving the key leader in that. And so you have to make sure you involve the appropriate parties to take care of it. Um, and be respectful to the person, whether they're angry or um, sad or crying or furious. You know, just be very respectful of it may not seem like it was um, bad on your end, but it was to them. So I have I respect that always and follow up, uh, close the loop with someone to make sure that uh, you followed it all the way through and take care of it. So I think. Um, having some diplomacy under fire is essential to be a good CEO. There's no question about it. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to believe we've been talking for almost an hour here. But <laughs> yes. um, so I've got I've got one last question for okay. you. Um, and, you know, funny enough, it was actually going to be my first question. And I was like, I'm going to save that one. So, uh, you know, when I think about um, so Jimmy Carter, when he in 1980 said, hey, we're going to have National Women's Week, right? Um, Women's History Week. There's a quote that uh, that I really like. He says, you know, from the first settlers who came to our shores, from the first American Indian families who befriended them, men and women have worked together to build this nation. And too often, the women were unsung, and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. And um, so as a, as a woman in a role of, of tremendous responsibility, I mean, there are people who their livelihood depends on you. There are patients that, you know, if, if you're not doing your job, there are consequences. Um 
What do you feel is important about Women's History Month? And really, what, what speaks to you about taking some time out to stop and, and think and, and recognize that in really the history of our community and of our nation? I, that's a good question, Matt. And I think uh, what's important to me about that is just the recognition that, and, and to his words, women have always been Women have always played a role in our history, whether they were the mothers of great leaders or whether they were the wives of great leaders or whether they were leaders in, truly in their role, early pioneer leaders, um, recognizing that it does take both women and men to create an amazing community. And so I think just that stop and remember where we've come from and, um, and then respect where we're going, you know, as a community. It's not about just women or just men. It's about collaborative thinking, working together, empowering other women to be successful, live the lives that they truly want to live, and um, and not just for the sake of being great women, but being great community people. Uh, because I think it's what makes a great community is everybody working together. So regardless of the role you choose as a woman, whether it's the most amazing mother and wife you can ever be or the most amazing CEO, um, help other people get to where they're going. So the month for me is, as a female leader, stop and help other female leaders get to their best destination. And so I think for women, you know, let's acknowledge it. Let's acknowledge where we've come from. But let's let's just be better every year um, as leaders and as community citizens. Well, that's I can't think of a better way to end it, Paula. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Um, to uh, to everybody listening, thank you for sharing uh, an hour of your of your day with us, and uh, we look forward to catching you next month. Paul, the Register, Tucson Orthopedic Institute. Thanks so much. Join Matt for another interesting culture at work podcast right here on TucsonBusinessRadioX.com. dot